every three seconds, a child dies because they're too poor to live. Today, 25,000 children will die from diarrhea, from a mosquito bite, from totally preventable diseases. One in five children living in developing countries, Africa, Indonesia, the Southern Hemisphere, one in five will not make their fifth birthday. Americans are wealthy and they're generous. Every year, Americans give $300 billion to charity, of which 5% goes to international causes. Why such a small proportion? For good reason. Because of the fear. We're afraid that our money will not get to the people and will not get to the projects. We're afraid, and we read about the mismanagement in international aid. And we're really concerned about what proportion of our money is going to get to the people in need. When we speak of poverty, what do we mean? We hear some very large numbers. What does it mean to an individual living in a remote rural village in Ethiopia or Africa? I would ask them, did you eat today? Do you have clean drinking water? Do you have a place to go to the bathroom? Do you know how to read and write your name. If you're sick, is there a nurse, a doctor, a clinic, or a hospital, or anywhere near to go? And I'd also ask, do you have the opportunity to make some money? The big idea is that we can act locally and impact globally. The big idea is that we can help move people from poverty to prosperity. The big idea is that we can help 300 million people in sub-Sahara Africa lift themselves out of poverty, to do that in our lifetime, and at the same time, give donors in the West, America, and the like in the Northern Hemisphere, give them the unique opportunity of being engaged in their giving, being fulfilled in their giving, and assure them, promise them, that 100% of their money will get to the people in need. When we set off on this journey, we knew nothing about these things. 10 years ago, I was a, an internet.com guy. Um, nothing very, very philanthropic about building an internet brokerage enabling day traders to make lots of money during the back end of the 90s. We were, our revenues were about half a million dollars a day in clicks as day traders extracted thousands and millions of dollars out of the financial markets. And that was the carpet that I was riding. My wife was on a very different path. A cyber core was having its success, and prior to its sale to Charles Schwab for internet dollars, she felt that she wanted to address the injustice of poverty. And she started down the path that led her to Ethiopia. It was a year later that I followed her down that path, and we decided almost 10 years to the day to fund a glimmer of hope, an Austin-based organization that would look at the international aid business and what we were starting to learn and the books that we were starting to read, one of which was Lords of Poverty, the power, the prestige, and the corruption of the international aid business. It described the atrocious mismanagement and corruption, of particularly the 60s, the 70s, and the 80s, of how billions, no, trillions of dollars from international governments were being channeled through to these poor countries and how little of it was having any effect at all. I couldn't finish the book. But I certainly concluded that sending money to other organizations down the traditional and existing paths of international aid was 
we discovered was not going to work for us. So there was much that we learned. And what has happened over the last 10 years is we have invested about $35 million into 4,000 programs and projects working with Ethiopians, which I will explain in more detail, and have been able to impact 2 million people's lives, acting locally, impacting globally. The applause is appreciated, but the truth is we've just started, and we need others to join us on the journey, and the others to understand that now exists a model, a blueprint that has been developed over the last 10 years that offers all of the key components to enabling hundreds of millions of people to lift themselves out of poverty. And that blueprint, that plan, the big idea is to offer that. There is no IP. We offer it for free in order that people can take pieces of it and apply it, be it in Ethiopia, be it in other African nations, be it in other um, um, developing countries. The first part of that model is it starts in a village, bottom up. Traditionally, international aid starts in an ivory tower with Westerners looking down their noses, telling those poor Africans what it is they need and want. We reject that model. We started by going and asking local people in their community, what is it that you need and want? And you know what they tell you? The first thing they ask for is clean drinking water and a place to go to the bathroom. They ask for classrooms for their children. They ask for health care for their sick. And so we started off down that path. The next thing in the model that we would suggest and that we have learned by working with and listening to the rural poor is to help them help themselves, to empower them, to enable them to lift themselves out of poverty. They have the will, they have the ability, the motivation to improve their lives. What they need is the support and the funding, and we can offer them that. The third important thing that we have learned is <clears throat> work with the local organizations on the ground. We don't need more expat Westerners driving around in white land cruisers telling them what they need. What we need is to fund and engage and work with local, in our case, Ethiopian, indigenous, self-help organizations, non-government organizations. They already existed. All they needed was help, support, and involvement. They are the ones that work with and represent the local communities. We buy the bricks. They build the walls. We buy the pump. They dig the hole together at a local level, helping them help themselves. That's how we build sustainable projects, asking what it is they need and want, engaging them. We heard it today, hands on in creating their new future. And then when we leave them to go to the next village, they are responsible and manage those projects. Fourthly, aid and trade, a hand up and a hand out. In the case of humanitarian aid, a glass of water, a classroom for a child, health care for the sick, we are willing and happy to aid them to provide and donate or grant money. And what we've learned is the importance of helping them make their own money. As obvious as it sounds, the way out of poverty is to make money. Microfinance, microloans, that's the way. Offering them small loans through their own microfinance Ethiopian institutions and enabling two groups of people in particular, agriculture and enterprise. To the farmers we say, if you will borrow the money for enabling you to irrigate the land and build your farm, they will see that rock and rubble becomes fields of green. And we have seen this hundreds of times. Fields of green mean you can feed yourself and your family and fields of green also means what you don't need to eat for yourself, you will sell in the local market, and you will make money, and so you will lift yourself out of poverty. The second area is enterprise, entrepreneurship. I know a little bit about that myself, and so do you too. And did we not all need some capital to start our businesses? Yes, we did. So too, particularly, we like to fund women entrepreneurs in Ethiopia. Women have been the Fuel the mules of society for decades, for centuries. 
by funding women startup businesses. And some of the smartest entrepreneurs I've seen are women, Ethiopian women. Very, very capable. All they need is the funding and the opportunity. So women entrepreneurs starting businesses and then they're saving money, they're paying back, they're borrowing more, they're developing their businesses. Aid and trade. And the fifth and final component that we have learned is you need it all. You need to integrate all of these components, aid and trade, water and sanitation and health care, and all of these need to be in a clustered, integrated manner. It's fine to go and build an isolated well, and they will have clean drinking water, but they will not lift themselves out of poverty. It needs all of these components. In addition, what we need to do is address what is it that the donor needs. The donor needs to be able to make informed choices. So let the donor start to understand the choices that he has. Do you want to fund water? Do you want to do a classroom? Do you want to do an entire classroom block? Do, or are you more interested in microfinance? What is it that touches your heart? In what way does the informed, engaged donor, engaged donor, the engaged donor wants to see photographs, wants to see videos, and if we really got it down and we have, we can offer them GPS coordinates in order they can go to Google Maps and see exactly where the school is or exactly where the well is that they have just funded. That's how we are able to do it at a glimmer of hope. The big idea, 300 million people in sub-Sahara Africa. How do we make that shift? How do we make that move? And why? The, one of the greatest injustices in the planet is that so few have so much and so many have so little. And one of the reasons that a glimmer of hope exists is to redress that imbalance, the injustice and the imbalance. Bono, Bono said, where you live or where you should not decide whether you live or whether you die. He also said, let us not be that generation that watches Africa go up in flames while we all stand around holding our watering cans. It also fulfills our human nature to be able to do the right thing, to help someone in need, and to fill that need. To, but if we're not able to get all of the money to the people in need, if we, so the traditional hurdles of traditional aid have now been removed. We've developed a model that others can apply in whichever country or whatever sector that they need and want. I would say that I would leave the sort of final word as to the great why to my wife Donna, who would say that each and every individual matters, that we are all connected, and we all have a shared responsibility. Thank you.